the services, we were sort of working out stage directions and choreography. Um, I said to him, you know how to pick the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels, which is today, uh, and these readings for the blessing of your buildings pretty much puts a very tall order in front of us as it regards to the life and ministry of this church. And what I want to do in a very brief fashion is sort of work, make a comment on each of these lessons as it particularly pertains to the ministry of the local church. What is God saying to us, in other words, through these lessons? They could be things that we might want to ask for, aspire to, and thank God for here in the life of this parish. And what I want to do is start with Old Testament, then go to Gospel, and then go to Epistle. And the reason I want to do that is more than chronological, although it is that. But I also want to go because it seems to be, it says some things in that order that not only cause us to ask God for things, but to thank Him for them as well. Because this day really is an extraordinary day of Thanksgiving. And it starts really with this visitation of the angels from Jacob. I love this story because Jacob is probably one of the least likely characters ever to deserve in any way, shape, or form a visitation from the angels of God. In fact, he really doesn't deserve it at all. Remember, if you look at what happened previous to this story, as I heard a friend say not too long ago, we're in for a long period of dysfunctional family time. <laughs> And that's exactly what's going on. I mean, remember, this is the guy who swindled his brother out of his birthright, who lied to his dad. His mother was in on the picture. She was basically a co-conspirator with Jacob. And once all of it comes to life, Jacob is literally running for his life because he saw us going to kill him. Now, there ain't a lot on television that can beat that. And, but that's what's going on. I mean, Jacob is basically a runaway, and he's a crook. His name doesn't mean supplanter for nothing. And yet, in the midst of him being in the middle of the wilderness, running away from the retinue that is with his brother, who is really going to be out to slay him, he has a visitation. The angels of God show up. The lesson for us is, and it's really for us, is that the blessings that we receive from God are his sheer gift. If, if we're still in any way somehow trying to hope that there's a, a balance sheet in heaven, and that somehow we end up on the positive side of the balance sheet, and that's going to be what gets us in, we are sadly mistaken. We are sadly mistaken. And it even affects our prayers that because it just comes out sometimes, even when we don't intend it. When we run into somebody or we know someone that we care about really deeply, and they're having a hard time and we want to pray for them, which of course we do, but then we begin to pray by saying, you know, oh Lord, she really deserves this. <laughs> and, and it is, in fact, an expression of our love and care for them and our appreciation for who they are. But the real fact of the matter is, is that we're all crooks just like Jacob. I mean... Let's be honest for a minute. At least in my life, and I at this point can only speak for myself, but most of the sins I haven't committed, I did so because I didn't have the opportunity. <laughs> I mean, that's who we are. That's why Paul will say later in Romans, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. The good news is, the balance sheet approach to religion is not appropriate for Christianity. Jesus' death and resurrection did all of that and threw it away. He's the one who set the balance sheet right. He's the one who says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, not just those who deserve it, and I will refresh you. Now, what does that say about all the church? It says to me that our arms should be just as wide as the arms of our God. In other words, if we're willing to admit, whether it be by actual act or by lack of opportunity, we share the same bloodline as Jacob the supplanter, then that means there's no tier of better and worse sins. We're all in this one together. And what that should say about a local church is, yeah, you're one of us, come on in. Literally, regardless of who they are, that there's room 
in the very love of the Savior for all who are willing to bend the knee to Him. Regardless. Regardless. Right, Mike? See, I didn't even use this. But I would also want to say is that that means there's got to be a course correction in us. Because people who've been in the church for a while really do get inculcated into this kind of religious mindset where their some sins are really better or worse than others. And it's just legalism. It's just legalism. It has no part and parcel of what it means to be the family of Jesus who died and rose again for all of us. Now, some of us are tougher than others in our rebellion. And so like Jacob, somebody has to come and basically wrestle us to the ground. And that's all right. So there are these stories where, bang, I once was lost and God intervened and he knocked me over and finally now I know how to say yes to him. He, he won, thank God, he won. And then there are others of us who are a different kind of temperament who in essence grow up really having that sense of God's presence all of our lives. None is better than the other. They're all welcome. And we all bend the knee together. That's Jacob. Now let's work, let's look at the epistle lesson. This story of this wonderful sort of war in heaven. It, it is war in heaven and it is wonderful because what the writer of Revelation is laying out for us is in essence a, a cosmic dimension of what happened on, in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And you need to know, the scripture really does believe in literal angels. And just for the record, so I. Um, so I actually really like this passage. But it says something I think important about the developing character of those who have in fact said yes to Christ. They understand that it's not just that they have said yes to him and they bend the knee in his presence. But he pours life and power and grace in them to raise them up for a purpose. To be men and women who literally witness in the world, wherever they are, that he is the Lord. He loves all people. All people can come and say yes to him. It has absolutely nothing to do with family background or lineage, which means gray lupus and paleons so not, really aren't any better than anybody else. <laughs> Because here it talks about a group of people who literally conquer. Who conquer. Not through their own strength. Not through their own character, education, family background, lineage. But they conquered, it says, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. In other words, God puts inside of each of us, if we're willing, not only to say yes to him, but to say yes, to say, I will be one of your disciples. I'm not just going to be an armchair believer. I'm willing to be one of your disciples. I want to have the joy, the joy, and it really is a joy, of being used by you to actually make a difference in the life of someone else. Whether it be by my prayers, or by my actions, by my service, by my sacrificial financial donations, by the time I make to serve other people, by the opening of my heart to tell the story of what's happening to me in terms of my faith. The, the possibilities are myriad and endless, and God will shape each one of us in such a way as to literally forge a body of people so no matter what the church needs, whether it's teaching or service or pastoral care, mutual ministry, leadership and worship, all of those are things that God forms us, inspires us for, and they become God's gift to the rest of us. Which means God puts something new inside of us. Which means each of you are in fact a gift to one another by the grace of God. And this church is a gift to this community. And beyond. Because you people travel. You go places. You are wherever you are. Christ's emissary. And God has put something deep and powerful in you that you can count on literally no matter where you are. 
whether it's in a church or at a home, whether it's on the golf course, whether it's downtown in a shop, whether it's on a trip, he's the Lord of the whole earth. So even if you end up in Fiji, is the Lord there? Absolutely, without a doubt. Just as much as that he's here, right here. And that willingness to say, God, I'm available. I want you to use me wherever I am, collectively comes together to form and shape a vocational ministry for this church. I'm looking forward to the day, because I haven't had this conversation yet. I'm, I've only been here for six months. To be able to sit down with your rector and others and say, tell me about the ministry of this parish. Why did God form this place? <laughs> what is it about this church that has his hand of blessing upon it. And how that comes about is when ordinary people say, I want to be available for God. Sometimes, like in this test, this lesson, it will be extraordinary, it will require extraordinary courage. A part of the gift of being in the Anglican communion is that we know people all over the world. And there are plenty of Anglicans in this day who are literally, not figuratively, literally laying down their lives as they stand for Christ, especially in places of political and religious oppression. It does something, at least it did to me, when I went on my Facebook page a few days ago and I saw a church, in, a photograph of a church in flames in Pakistan. And that could have been repeated again and again and again and again. These are our brothers and sisters. And so we say, even though we don't suffer that kind of persecution, we're willing to stand and take our place with them and serve in the community that God has given us for the praise of His name. That's the revelation lesson. Finally, the gospel lesson. Nathaniel's an unlikely character. He doesn't expect anything. And it's shocking to him when this carpenter rabbi from Nazareth it's basically and miraculously reads his mail. <laughs> Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. In other words, you know what he believes because he's always a straight shooter. He says exactly what he thinks. <laughs> so Nathaniel basically says, now wait a second, I've never seen you before. Where did you get to know me? And Jesus does this kind of interesting sort of translocal miraculous piece of geography. He said, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. <coughs> I was out in a field somewhere. I didn't see anybody else there. That's what's really going on. How, how is it that you saw me? You were there. Which is why Nathaniel's reply is, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Here's the point. As we get out, as we serve, and as we give, there are times when it really is tough. The promise of this, see, God had a plan for Nathaniel. And God, in that moment, gave Nathaniel a brand new picture of who Jesus was by that miraculous moment. The very reason that we gather at the rail to receive the Eucharist, the reason we baptize is that we open ourselves up to the very miraculous presence of God. Because Nathaniel needed that. We, there are things that we need too. We need God to break into our lives. To give us things that we could never have earned for ourselves. If we're going to be in His service, and it really requires His Spirit to do it. God, I need your miracles these days, please. And sometimes that happens when we stay, kneel at the wheel and we receive it. All of a sudden, it's not just like any other Sunday, but instead something breaks through in the receiving of the bread and the wine, where we know we've literally encountered the very presence of Jesus. <laughs> or we are talking to a friend of ours, and they begin to say something, and you know, our face looks the same, but inside we go, wow, I needed to hear that today. <laughs> or a letter. I mean, there are these, all these little signs that God sends us. Sometimes they're subtle. That's Einstein's famous phrase. Subtle is the Lord. But sometimes they're clear and obvious. God literally providing what we need in the moment so that we have the strength that we need to be about His business. So, we're
We're doing more than dedicating a building. We're dedicating the people. We're standing together as the body of Christ and saying, by God's help, we will. To fulfill the purpose that God has for this parish, there's a reason you're here. There's a calling that is on you as a people that cannot be fulfilled by any other people. It's different from Trinity, if you're right. It's different from the Roman Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church, who have representatives here. Thank you so much, because we are one body. It's unique to you. There's a reason, a supernatural reason, that you have been called to be here. And as you live and work, laugh, cry, pray, live and walk together, it will emerge in your midst as the people in your pew, in the pews and you say, here I am, Lord. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily qualify for much of anything. I'm a Jacob. But I'm willing to receive what it is that you want to give me. I want to be about what it is that you want to do. Use me as you see fit. And as you walk in the way that he has opened up for you, he will surprise you with his blessings and show you more and more why we have gathered. So I ask you today, are you willing to be a part of that personal rededication? We're thanking God for buildings. But we're only thanking God for buildings because he's providing through these buildings places for his people to exercise the ministries that he has given them. Will you be about that? If that's true, then there will be long after today much rejoicing because accompanied by the very presence of God's holy angels, a group of people in Vero have said, Yes. Let us pray together. <clears throat> Gracious Lord, thank you that though we deserve nothing, you and your mercy pour out upon us all that we need and more. Open our hearts and our minds today to the refreshing grace of your presence, to the challenge of your to the excitement of the adventure of being available for you wherever we are. May this body, wondrous as it is, continue to come alive in your presence. May this be a place where your miracles, for your life, and your ministry are manifested. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to take you up.